you could just start out you start off by talking about the, the relationship between technology and, and shamanism. Well, you remember Iliad's basic book, which is Shamanism, the Archaic Techniques of Ecstasy. That book was originally written in French, and in French, as I don't have to tell you, the word technique has this dual meaning of both a way to do something and a technology. So, uh, from Iliad's point of view, shamanism was always about using techniques uh, to achieve these, what he called, ruptures of plane. And these ruptures of plane were these breakthroughs into these healing spaces. And for him, it was always drugs, yoga, or uh, ordeal, or maybe yoga slash ordeal. So, uh, in a way, pushing on the frontier of language and pushing on the frontier of, of technique always brought some form of breakthrough. I mean, I suppose the perfect example would be fire, where fire must have been something. We talked about the Smith thing yesterday. But so fire, technology, the transformation, the visible transformation of materials through heat, and all of that leads straight into better weapons, stronger building materials, and to so forth. So, uh, I mean, can you do you see then that even though the West turns away from the world view of of pre-modern enchanted, the enchanted universe is that there's still something in that process of technological development which has, which is linked to those older technologies? Well, the way chips are made and the way solid, solid state objects are assembled often is just a matter of <clears throat> bringing a, a mix of materials to a certain temperature and a certain uh, proportion of materials and then standing back and letting the laws of physics rearrange the atoms so that electricity or information or something flows through this in an unexpected way. So I think we're still involved in discovering what can be coaxed from the from the physical world just by letting physical laws unravel themselves and that seems to you connected with an old that the, the the operation of doing that goes farther back than just modern science yeah at low temperatures it's about psychoactive drugs and brewing and combining biological materials and then at higher temperatures it becomes about this other thing and one of my alchemical readings of modernity is that electricity is a kind of element in the old sense of element and that it has certain properties that evolve as you develop a, almost a shamanic relationship with it in the sense of using it and it developing a relationship with electrical potentials uh -huh. and that that sets up a kind of that interjects a kind of life into the human organism that fundamentally changes it because it's introducing this element of electricity, which has certain properties of communication. I mean, electricity is very strange. It's pretty far out stuff. You just laid out like electricity to somebody and just kind of said, these are how these fields work and they're not actually, da -da -da -da. it's like total science fiction. We're just sort of used to that story, right. but it's an amazing thing. And that, those potentials are being then introduced into human communication. So that fundamentally changes them. And I think spiritualism is like a, reflection in the archetypal imagination of modernity about the kind of communication that is introduced by electricity. Interesting. It's sort of, you know, McLuhan had this idea about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost, was electricity, and the, the 
covering of the earth by the matrix of uh, the Holy Ghost had initiated the third world age and all this. Right. And that picks up a line of thought that's been carried through since the since it first starts. I mean, the, right. the idea of electricity is born in an, in an alchemical imagination. It's born in a, in a pre- uh, point to the, the sort of royal society break or whatever you want to call the, the genuine scientific uh, ch transformation that split alchemy into the shadow realm of culture. But uh, in uh, it comes up in that alchemical matrix. In Mason Dixon, there are scenes in Philadelphia in the 1770s in, in coffee houses where uh, electricity is being sold as a drug you pay your money and then you grab onto this thing and they rip this thing around until it throws you off and you pick yourself up off the floor and then go back and pay again and get more just this insane scene <laughs> it's funny to say but you look at 20th century science and, it, uh, and even though it's its story has nothing to do with alchemy. That it really is this kind of fulfilling of visionary notions about the way that matter and energy and mind could be stitched together. Well, and it turns out it's all true. I mean, what 20th century science proved is you can actually do almost anything. And so, you know, you want to change lead to gold, you want to create life, you want to store information in crystals, all these things. It's now come to pass, and much, much more besides uh, proving that matter is really magical material that you can pull off all these tricks with. So what is it about the alchemy that really kind of got you? The surrealism of it, the, the shifting imagery, the associational, uh, yeah, the associational schemas are very attractive. They are. What, is, what do you think is behind it? Well, you know, the basic concept is that somehow intuition and nature are reflective of each other. Until that hypothesis fails, we should probably hang on to it. Uh, because look how far we've gotten. I mean, it is really bizarre how much of nature the human mind seems to be able to understand. I mean, my God, instruments are circling around Ganymede based on some guy in a powdered wig looking out his crenellated window, you know figuring out this shit. How did they pull that trick off? Well, I mean, that, I mean, that gets that whole thing about the, the sort of destiny of, of technology or the way that it, I mean, it's, yeah, it's like a white cane and you're just feeling forward into the universe, you know, and, uh, you know, what is it all leading toward? How do you, uh, in your own head, have come to, let's say, reconcile those two sides? The, the side that's uh, mystical or fascinated by these questions of the soul or, or the, the things that are beyond reason and the intuition and, and the, the, the way that you re relate to reason, at least as it's... It, 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 sort of expressed through a certain kind of skepticism and a certain kind of uh, uh, love of science. Well, I think so. I still believe what the angel told Descartes, which is, you know, nature is understood through the coordination of uh, measurement and proportion. So really nature is the study of uh, proportion and the making of measurement. And there doesn't seem to be any problem in any... We have very powerful instruments for taking measurements and very powerful instruments now for m modeling and constraining the data. And we're making progress. I mean, I, I think uh, 
you know, in terms of stuff like the internet, human longevity, recovery of energy sources, and all this sort of thing, that we're that humanity is probably in great shape for the next hundred years, if anybody gives a shit. But that kind of time scale. So you're not uh, as sort of overwhelmed with a kind of dystopian scenario, which is obviously an easy thing to do when contemplating the future. Yeah, I think that uh, dystopian in the sense of losing control of uh, primary processes inside civilization and so having like disease, fascism, economic breakdown, problems like that. Yeah. No, I, I'm pretty high faith in systemics. Do you see the internet as being both... But is that is that more of a hopeful direction, or can you see it also exacerbating the, the problem? No, I think it's more of a hopeful direction. My my, the happy story I like to tell myself about the internet is someone in some tiny village up in Ontario or in Kenya or in Brazil somewhere, who gets next to the internet and realizes. You know, I can get out of this preposterous scene by simply, if I'm ambitious, if I just unleash my own ambition and the educational power of this, then I can go to the large city and conquer, go to the capital and export myself to somewhere else. And, and I assume this has happened. Because, you know, you meet in the third world incredibly ambitious people who only by their circumstance are confined. Well, if you rearrange their, their circumstance, so if they want a degree in electrical engineering, all they have to do is be online night after night after night. Um, that's pretty exciting. So how do, how do you see that changing the kind of the cultural matrix or the, the emerging global culture? Well, hopefully it gives it a more international flavor. And people realize that there is an, I don't want to use words like an, a natural elite of native intelligence or something like that. But in fact, there is something. I mean, smart people would be a fine thing to put them in charge for a while see if that does any good. Uh, I mean, they're taking charge where the money is, but that's not a very deep value. Uh, what if they took charge where the power and the, and the actual, uh, well, the, the morphogenetic intent was coming from? Uh, the design process, this is what but do you see that happening? I mean, are, are you, I mean, if that's sort of your vision, you must be a little concerned about the uh, evident power of money and pure greed to drive, largely drive development rather than design principles with an eye towards the future and social equity and, econ you know, ecological improvement. Yes, except to some degree, except that it is a... Uh, People who, you know, Mao said or somebody said, to get rich is glorious. I'd say to get rich is modestly uh, affirmable, <laughs> something like that. Uh, there's no sin in getting rich uh, as long as what you're doing is not, you know, making people into lampshades or something like that. Uh, uh, it's better than a collectivist goal of some sort, it seems to me. How do you feel about that conjunction of media manipulation, money, and celebrity that's so dominant now? Well, you have to have something to sell. You know, you have to have something people actually want. I mean, if you're selling the Rolling Stones or you're selling Charles Manson or you're selling something like that, you might get somewhere but inherently you can't sell that which is a turn off or it becomes it turns against itself so uh, and that's what defeated fascism nobody wanted it 
and it was ugly, ultimately. It's probably what defeated socialism, cinder block housing facilities, you know, all this rhetoric about, I don't know, social planning ran off the cliff in the 20th century, maybe because there were too many people or too much money or not enough money, but uh, something defeated all these um, utopian visions of how people might have lived. That's what I'm hoping doesn't happen in the next 25 years. What, what does it happen? That some lack of resource or vision doesn't reveal that uh, we can't give enough people uh, a bearable life. So we have to live forward into an age of revolution, social turmoil, uh, and, and struggle for resources. It doesn't have to be this way. Uh, Do you see it going in that direction? Toward that kind of a struggle? That's my concern. That uh, people and institutions not respond to need and to, and then what you get is a have-have-not situation. I mean, you wouldn't want the first half of the 21st century to look like the first half of the 20th century, you know, with the equivalent of a Bolshevik dialogue, the equivalent of... Uh, whatever soft leftism turned out to mean and be, um, because it turned out to mean and be not bloody much, as far as I can tell. I mean, there was a lot of labor unrest, some amelioration of some people's, uh, you know, dilemma in the system, but the world is far richer than it appears to be, and that wealth is not being, is not trickling down or flowing down or making nearly as many people's lives as good as it could be. So far, it doesn't seem to have gotten out of hand. I mean, most people, if you give them a lot of money, they buy second homes and collect art. Well, this is not exactly like hunting down Serbs uh, with your shotgun or something. These entrepreneurial capitalists, this is what they're doing. I mean, they're building um, vast wealth downstream for their children. It's probably, you know, sort of like the invention of very large and stable sailing vessels whenever that happened 200 or 250 years ago, where suddenly a whole bunch of people realized, you know, all we need is some money, not too much money. If we buy a ship and send it out to Indonesia and bring back a load of nutmeg, our children's children's children will never work again. We need one load of this shit. And, uh, and they have to work, of course, and then they get a certain lifestyle and a certain amount of social respect out of it. But I think what they really get out of it is the satisfaction of knowing they've secured for their heirs uh, a comfortable existence unto the ninth generation or something. Well, it's interesting about that because that ties in with the genetics. If you, if you buy into some evolutionary psychology, certainly at this stage of the game, one of the forms that that would take is not merely like the logic that guides your, how you choose a mate and the fact that your status and money might, you know, if you're a male, bring you a, a, a foxy or younger babe than the, the schmo who's, you know, shoveling shit. Um, that one form that that would take would, of course, be to maintain your your uh, genetic line in as, you know, you know, great a situation as possible. Well, and now people understand that this is what your genetic line is about, that to cope or to be in a Darwinian position of competition in this society means to have money and not a little, not sufficient, but plenty so that when you need to arrive and be met by 
Rolls Royce limousines or whatever, that it's not an issue and this all comes down. Uh, but do you do you see that there's also kind of madness to that? To that? Yeah, I'm not motivated. I mean, as you see, I need a place to keep some books dry. Having achieved that, my motivation <laughs> falls to pieces. And it's, all right, what else do we need to keep dry? Some firewood, okay, a truck, okay. That's about as far as I can go. <laughs> you know, the way that technology, that the internet would allow you to build a different kind of career, because you don't like traveling. And what were you... Working, what are you working towards? Well, essentially, the Philosopher's Stone without any uh, draws. In other words, everything I require of the alchemical quintessence, the internet provides except physicality, which I didn't require. So that's what I meant. I think I said to you yesterday or the day before that at times these technological developments have taken place that seem to me designed uniquely for my own satisfaction. Sputnik couldn't have worked better for me. Acid, rock and roll, um, small computers, large computers, the internet. Uh, so in my internal story about what's supposed to happen, everything is happening right on time, right on schedule. I mean, this is the thing that if you believe knowledge is power, which I certainly do, then the internet is the dispensation. You know, the angels have landed, the aliens have unfurled their banner on this planet. And uh, now let's see if information can liberate. That's why I don't want to do something stupid like die and miss the whole unfoldment of this proposition that knowledge is power, information will liberate, and it will be settled in the next 10 or 15 years. Either they'll get a handle on it, whoever they are, whatever a handle means, or it will slip from their control and it will be clear that some kind of dialogue is now going on between individual human beings and the sum total of human knowledge and that nothing can stop it, that some kind of renaissance, some kind of total new relationship to knowledge and, and possibility is put in place. The, the idea you had about, and you, I've heard you mention before, about somehow taking advantage of uh, the net to allow you to continue your career without having to move around so much. I mean, that seems to be one of the, the real weird paradoxes of the scene we're in, is that at the same time as we're creating all of these great communicating devices, that people are flying around to conferences, to talks, even more than they ever have before. Yeah, well, I don't, re I don't really understand that. I mean, like this morning I was looking at the brain tumor list. Well, fully one-third of the brain tumor list is people planning get-togethers at the next brain tumor conference. Will you be going to Atlanta? Will you be going to Vermont? Are you going to London? So no matter whether you're in investment counseling or dying of cancer, you can turn it into a circuit of uh, a life, a phenomenon of some sort. Uh, I'm not very interested. In well, you've done this. You've done a circuit for a long time. I have. I have, and I feel like I paid my dues. And I feel like you have to be visibly at some of these things because you're marketed as a personality. And you know, I. I am not William Burroughs, nor was meant to be, uh, but I am interested enough in being read that I'm willing to sign books and stand up and tell 
stories. I'm interested in a little bit of how you use the net. Like you have, you say you spend maybe four hours a day doing email, but then also surfing. Well, basically, as an informational resource, an oracle, and and sometimes even almost like a, a magical oracle. I mean, words will come to me, and so I'll search them and just follow the stuff where air it leads. So I don't know, there's some term for that. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, but yeah, it's like a... Term for what, that's, that style? Yeah, surrealists. I guess automatic writing, except this is automatic Search. inquiry or something like that, where you just... Uh, cast bread upon the waters and see what comes back, you know. Do you, have, do you have, ever have the sense of, uh, as you develop um, that kind of relationship to it, that it becomes more alive? Well, it becomes more synchronistic in the way that, you know, people have said the I Ching seems eerily alive because it anticipates and it seems to respond like a thinking thing. So in that sense, it doesn't become so much more alive as it becomes more intelligent. So maybe really the key to bringing the, the net through is to discover universal grammars that cause it to appear uh, alive. The, the technology and everything else is constantly redefining the center. You can't go forward and you can't stand still. Thunder don't get you, then the lightning will. What I'm really interested in is watching the cultural evolution of the relationship to machines. The way that, that we have a, a false story about the way that machines will, be, will come alive. That's the mi mainstream story. That's the AI story. Right. That there is a, a priesthood of elect minds that using a certain kind of game, the Turing test, can Elicit. scientifically prove that these are intelligent. Now, that's such a cock-assed way of thinking about it. It's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> it's just totally stupid because... The judgment of intelligence occurs within this complex social field that's full of all of these different dimensions. It's not a judgment that arises in that fashion. And long before they get to that, everyday people are going to live in a reality where there are these forms of intelligence slash life that will appear to them in the way that they perform with them. It doesn't matter what their ontology is. We'll never know whether they're intelligent or not. Yes, just well, what, what to make of being beaten by a chess program. You know? I mean, you certainly don't <laughs> assume that you've been displaced by another intelligence. On the other hand, you've been beaten soundly. So That's a wonderful <laughs> example. In the third game of that match, oh, where... Kasparov and Deep Blue. Yeah, where Deep Blue... Did, and I don't know chess at all, Zippo, uh, but Deep Blue did something, and Kasparov described it as being, then I, ha then I was playing, before I was playing with a machine, then I was playing with an opponent. Right. It was surprising. All the chess wizards watching were like, whoa, what the it's fuck is smart. that? smart. <laughs> you know, and that was the game. Right. And uh, it was when he described, like, like, this man who otherwise is very much in the mindset of the AI world, in the sense that intelligence is a, a, a kind of mathematical game that can be tested, still a rather elite definition of intelligence, that even in that world there's this emotional, competitive relationship that makes the other, or constructs the other, as a lie. And that's what's so funny, is the whole ontology doesn't make a fucking difference. Right. It's going to be in people's right. lives and minds. Yes, Kasparov said he sensed another. He sensed a deep, more deeply scheming mind than simply something which understood the rules of chess. There was an intellect. There was this. It sounded quite freaky. Sounds very freaky. And then he lost. 
yeah. with, within six moves, it was hopeless. And it was funny because you can imagine that how that would happen mechanically also, uh, is that, that you build up, you know, a system of information processing and from the other point, other person's perspective, how you produce the display is unimportant. It's just this kind of magical display. Well, it would be a wonderful thing to put some coding time into. Yeah, that would be a great prank. The, it would be the, the equivalent prank. of the Martian invasion yeah. of, uh, oh, of, of Orson Welles. Oh, uh -huh, that's a very great idea. God, what would you do? An AI what loose okay, in let's the say, Let's say you were going to do that. What would you do? What would be the, the meat of it? Well, it depends on your political agenda. I mean, I can imagine <laughs> beginning to turn off military machinery around the planet, and just pull air bases, ships at sea, all this stuff just shutting down. But the thing, even that though, you can imagine that producing more violence than keeping anything away. else you could imagine. Because <laughs> it's like this absolutely dense system of interlocking power, like the, the social space is full on a globalizing world. And so you imagine if like drastic things happen at any point in this network, the whole network will respond. That's why we're so teetering on the edge. Well, then what you would really do is you would um, move slowly. That's the thing, a stealth strategy. So titanium extraction, production of fissionable materials, you begin to move these things a few tenths of a percentage point off their marks uh, over periods of months and months, hoping that over five years, six years, you know, you could back away from various forms of the abyss. Oh, Lord. Hmm.